I remember the first time um, John Staples, who was teaching religion, he's passed away since then, called me on the phone and he said, how would you like to go to Russia with an evangelistic team? Well, this was very, very shortly after um, the Iron Curtain fell, after the communism fell. And boy, I, I, I couldn't believe, you know, they, so Susie Mundy, uh, who was, was going to do the children's meetings, Warren Ashworth, John Staples, and um, we had one other person do the medical, and I was to do the music. Well, I remember when we first arrived in Russia in Red Square there, I, I looked and I said, I can't believe I'm here after hearing so much you know, through the years. And it was a wonderful experience. I couldn't, it was like nothing else that I ever envisioned. To me, it was like if someone said, I want to give you a free trip to the moon. It was about as remotely possible for me to go to Russia. And yet there I was. Little did I, re little I realized that I'd make 10 more trips over there through the years. But the first time of anything, it's, it's an eye-opening experience. I remember when we had the meetings, um, and I was involved not just in the music, uh, but I also did some, um, later on in, in other years, I did some medical talks, and I actually did some preaching in some of the churches. So um, then the kids, well, when we went there, most of the people had never seen an American before, especially the young children, no one, you know. So. I was like the Pied Piper. Kids were following me around. I'd come into the auditorium. There was a whole stream of a dozen kids wanting to carry my camera bag, carry my violin, whatever I had. And we would sit and mount on the front row. And then I would play in the music. But I still remember that an hour before the meeting even began, the doors weren't even open to the huge auditorium. It sat about 2,000 people. The doors were barred shut. And the locks over in Russia, they're huge locks, and no one can get in. And they only they have several doors, but they only open one side of it. So it's like a small funnel for people to go in and out. They were huddled around that door. There must have been a hundred, several hundred people, like cattle, waiting to get in. They just sat, just stood there, waiting and waiting and waiting, and finally the door opened, and they would rush in and get their seats. And even in pouring down rain, they would stand there with their umbrellas and, and wait to get in. Uh, I still remember when we gave out Bibles the first time, these people, none of them had ever owned a Bible. And to see them grasp it in their hands and take it up to give it a kiss or hold it close to them like this, it was, it really touched my heart to see how wonderful, well, they thought that having a Bible of the very own, I thought, how often do we treat God's holy word in that way? It doesn't always come across that way. We had um, a great baptism, and uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I can't go into all of the experiences I had over there. I'd be here all half the night, probably. But we, each successive year, we went to a different place. And... It was, it was wonderful each time, each place. I remember Derzinks, I think that was the third year we went over. This city was a closed city during the communist time, which meant that it was a factory city. Nobody could go in or out without special permission. You were like prisoners. You worked in the factory, and if you needed to go to a relative or something, you had to get special permission to leave, and no one could come in. Well, it was open now, of course. We were free to give meetings there, so we had this huge auditorium. And I remember one lady who spoke some English came up to me. And um, we had looked around the city a little bit, you know, a pretty dismal city. Um, when the sun set, everyone disappeared off the streets. They even turned the street lights, the uh, traffic lights off to save electricity. Um, the lady, she asked me, she said, what do you think of our city? And I would pause, I was kind of groping for some words to say. And, and then before I had a chance to answer, she said, ours is the city God forgot. Those words haunted me for a long time, still do. 
Ours is the city that God forgot. I assured her that God did not forget the city. And that's, that's why we were here, to show God's love to the people. So it was um, a heart-rending experience. And you know, I've always felt when we left, I'll tell you, um, traveling overseas, you make friends immediately, especially if they take you into your ho their homes. And you become bonded for life and much closer than you do in this country. I mean, they did everything for us. They fed us, they, they, you know, you name it. So we had really um, an incredible time. It wasn't easy. I mean, the food was hard to get used to. Sometimes we got sick and, and um, we didn't have the amenities at home. Well, one good example, <clears throat> I remember Warren Ashworth, um, he ran out of paper to, he was gonna send some letters over, so he, he got some toilet paper and wrote a letter home on that. But we usually didn't get toilet paper. We, they had a book in the bathroom and you'd just tear out the pages. Well, that's just one example of, of what life was like over there back in those days. Russia has changed a lot since then. Now there are stores, modern stores and so on. And, and Moscow it was at one time the most expensive city in the world. And um, I remember traveling when I was in the uh, city there with some friends and they would go to a department store. It was an underground department store. And uh, she said, when we come to the city, we look at all of the wonderful merchandise they have here. And then we look at the price tag. And she says, what is that? That looks like a telephone number. The prices in rubles were so high. They couldn't even dream of buying something like that. So um, I made, made some wonderful friends there and with the pianist I worked with. I remember the first year I went over, I didn't know who I would have to accompany me on the piano. So I went to the music school, um, had a translator with me, and he said, we have three teachers, music teachers, that are willing to play for you. And he brought them all, three of them out. They were young ladies, probably um, late 20s, early 30s, something like that. And um, he said, through my translator, which one do you want? I said, I don't know. I said, I have to hear them play with me. So I had a piece, I played, and they accompanied me. Each one came in for five, 10 minutes. And then I came out, and then he said, the director of the school said, which one do you want? I said, I can't decide. I said, I'll take all three of them. So each week I had a different pianist for the three weeks. We were there a month actually. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience uh, with you know, getting to know these people and so on. So the um, fourth year, I think it was, we went to Ukraine and Yevpatoria down by the Black Sea actually in the Crimea. Now, today, of course, you have to have a Russian passport to get in, but then you didn't. So Ukraine was, uh, it was a hot, humid place, but the people came out nonetheless, you know, and enjoyed our presentations and the music and in, in the gospel that was being preached. I remember a lady came up to me. Um, this was a couple years after the disaster at Chernobyl, that nuclear disaster that, you know, in fact, did you know, I just heard on the news that the, uh, there's some place up on Antarctic that they're finding traces of um, the radiation that seeped into the vegetation up there and the wildlife up there. But anyway, this lady came up to me and I was giving a health lecture and she brought her son to me, and he was completely bald. And she says, what can you do to help him grow his hair back? It was radiation exposure. So I told her, I said, I'm not a doctor. I said, there's, there's really nothing I can do. I think one of the most heart-rending experiences I ever had was to a hospital where there were nothing but children. And they were lying in beds in, in various states of health. Many of them were bald 
and you could see the effects of the radiation exposure uh, that they had. Um, the last trip I made, which was three years ago to Ukraine, was in Kiev. They have a museum there. And I took some pictures. Uh, they had uh, two walls, big walls, plastered with the pictures of children who died because of that horrendous exposure to that radiation. It was so sad to see that. Um, I have a number of friends over there and um, we try to correspond by Skype or internet, whatever. And the, the work is going forward. However, Russia has pretty much closed its doors right now. And the last time I, I was in Russia, I had the feeling that, that the, the, uh, there was some disruption. People came in and didn't want the meetings to go on. It's the Orthodox Church that is behind it.